album encore, the first album since you reformed, and and uh, a number one album in two thousand nineteen. Yeah. It's a pretty weird concept to get your head around, I would imagine. Yeah, uh, really amazing, and um, because I think we wanted to make a record because we needed new songs, uh, and we knew that we were going to tour this year for the fortieth anniversary. Um, but faced with like doing the same material again, it didn't feel right. So um, the obvious thing is to sit down and write songs, and um, we did that in a demo room. So we recorded songs too, and it just felt like it was turning into an album um, because we hadn't sort of signed to Universal at that point. So it was just us in a room, um, yeah, demoing and it went really smooth and um, it just felt like we should make a record. Hmm. Was, um, is that daunting then, beginning a new record? Because you, I, I take it you weren't that sure if an album would come out of these demos and processes. Well, but... we started with covers because we were the original covers band anyway, you know, with yeah. songs like Monkey Man and Message to You, Rudy. So everybody, so the three of us, brought a cover along and said, well, let, let, let's try and in interpret that, you know, because we got, so that the material was there and it was just how we interpret it. So that was how we sort of put our toe in the water, shall mm. we say. When, at what point did you start to, is it exciting the, the right word to describe something that's going well? I don't well, know, it was, it was positive? positive? It was positive, that, yeah, that's a good word, yeah. yeah. yeah mm. okay, they. they we we seem to get get the covers right, or like okay that that was good. And that, now what else can we do? And then it was like well I've got this um, bass line that I've written, and then Terry got I've got this idea about a song that goes like this, and then Linval brought some stuff along. So it sort of it sort of happened gradually. But as as Terry said, there wasn't there was no pressure on it. I think the thing back in the day there it was always you know make you know make the album in six weeks, and we haven't written anything yet, and that sort of stuff. But whereas this, it was like we were able to work at our own pace, and I think that was that was a, a very positive thing to do. Yeah, positive is the word that we should. Yeah, I think I think it was like kind of um. It was, it, it was, I would say probably this is probably one of the, the smoothest record we've ever made because, you know, each record of different, the very first record with Elvis Costello, that was through having, uh, that period we were just drinking a lot and doing everything that was, you know, what you do as a youth, you know. The second record, we, we started to just falling apart. So mm. it was a different, different vibe. This one, we just went in there. And we just sat down. And we, it just it, it was the easiest record for for me. That it was I thoroughly enjoyed making this record. Although the other two records I enjoyed them, but for different reasons. This one is for wow, I'm relaxed now. Mm. This is so relaxing and so <laughs> smooth. Um, you know, you know, there's times I just fall asleep, mm. and I wake up. Like, Where we are now, guys? And all right, then, okay. You know, it's, it was just really lovely. But it's all about the quality of the songs again here, yeah. isn't it? You, mm. you know, we shall hope the life and times of the. The Man Called Depression, uh, mm. BLM, Vote For Me, there's a lot going on. So there was a wealth of great songs. Uh, I'm sure it didn't start that way, but the confidence must have come as these songs began to materialise, formulate or whatever. I think we had really good ideas mm. and, and subject matter, really, and uh, that helped a lot. And because of now our age, there's like a sort of a voice of experience a bit, like the stuff that we're talking about, we've been through, and... Um, so it's like a reflection on our lives, really, and, and plus like how we still feel today. And and when it turns into a sort of political song, we can look at it from a different angle. When we were kids, you looked at it from the angle like you're in it and you, you, you want to get out of it. Now you can look at it and say, well, I've been through that and, you know, this is dodgy ground or this is maybe you should try this. And it's more conversational, I think, now. And it was between the three of us. Mm. Mm. The when did you get confident about the the record? Then at what what point? Well, we found that we could actually work together and make it's obviously a, a, and make some mm -hmm. music. Yeah. Um, and we were all we were all in in agreement. We also had the services of a, a, a splendid um, musician, Nikolai Torp Larsen, who's our, our key, who's been our keyboard player since we reformed in 2008. He was, he was helping out, so he was helping arrange stuff and doing all that technical business right. that, that we weren't able to do. So we actually had a, a, a working unit and we were able, I think um, the maturity of advanced years, shall we say, <laughs> has enabled us, you know, we, we, I think we now have the people skills to work together yes, and yeah. a, for, to a, a, 
a, a common end. Do you trust your own ears or do you have to go and play it to somebody else? Family, friends, somebody you trust? Well, I, I trust my own ears, really. Mm -hmm. and uh, You I rely on them totally. Yeah, and I don't like listen or show anybody anything until it's done because right. uh, I think that's it should come from, I don't want to be influenced and it's interesting what Horace was saying because if like if if there was an idea I had I'd question question it before I'd raised it so I'd think to myself would Horace and Linval agree with this or disagree with it and if I thought they'd disagree with it I wouldn't raise it Right. So that avoided any petty arguments mm. about it's got to be like this, it's got to be like this. It's it's nice to sort of edit it yourself first. Mm. Making specials albums in the past was, or recording specials was always very fraught, yeah. as, as I think Linval yeah. alluded to. Yeah. Ghost Town was uh, recording. Ghost Town was an absolute mm. force of the will, yeah. really, to, to to get that I done. Know, the know. result was fantastic, yeah. but yeah. But, um, but it was not a happy memory. Uh, uh, recording it. You, you have to go through the pain for the gain? Or, or mm. the but but this, it. as Limbo was saying, this, this was a lot easier because I think we'd done that and you know, we, we, we were able to use hindsight for once. Mm. The political landscape, Limbo, um, you were part of the, the brilliant Windrush um, uh, when came from the, the Caribbean Tobago mm -hmm. and uh, brought their colour. You brought your colour, your food, the calypso and reggae led onto mm. sound systems and absorbed into punk. Mm. Things haven't really changed a great deal, really. Thank the, I think things have gone backwards. It is, it is so strange because I, I left Jamaica, was it 1964, you know, so, I, um, uh, you know, and, and, and a ship called the Askin, that's where me and my sister, and me, my sister and I we both had one passport between both of us. Right. And, to, and to see what's happening today, mm. where other kids who, who, who come to England and never left England, you know, and, and still didn't register as a, as a, as a British citizen, I got their, their their documents for as a British citizen, and see what they've got to go through now, right? And I think it's it's a it's um, um, a godsend that you know that with the specials I got, and it was true touring with the specials. That's how I decided, you know, something here here I'm with my Jamaican passport, mm -hmm. where I go to different um, customers, um, you know, the word alien, you know, sort of um, it's a weird word. strike me. Of, what am I? I'm just an alien because of this this little this little blue book, you know. Mm -hmm. So um, me and Neville, you know, we both got our, our British passport, and so that gave us the freedom to yeah. to move around. But those, when, when I heard, read some of these stories um, through like the Guardian newspaper, and see what some of these people, or you know, their their pensioners, you know, and and and, and to, to 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 go back to Jamaica and yeah. even to visit distant rel family there, you know, yeah. they can't get back to England, or they they, they weren't allowed to come back to England. Mm. They spend most of their life here. They have the national insurance number. They worked. They pay in the system. Mm. But in a way, they got deleted. I think, oh, did that happen? Yeah. And reflecting that on the album yeah. in this yeah. moment, is, mm. has it been difficult? Or do you feel, though, you've tackled it as the best you can? Because we can get bogged down with Brexit and all this nonsense. Mm. and um, We still don't know what's going on. But for you, how... How have you tackled it? And, and uh, it seems like we're retrogressing. It was strange because just now when, um, you know, my sister, you know, um, when I played my sister, um, the, the sort of early stage of um, um, BLM, right? And, went, and she, you know, and as soon as she heard, come here, you she's jumped, she cringed, you know? Yeah. Because yeah. that's, 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 that's where we're coming from. I know how, how, how tough that was for us to emotionally, because that was, it was such a, a heavy negative vibe on us. It was thrown at us in such a vibe, you know, such a, because it, 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 it was violent that way, you know? And um, to see the reaction on her face, when, when was, you know, I said, this is really, this is what happened because we just wanted to, uh, at times just to get away from that time, you know? Mm. But now I, I, I read where, where, where's um, Dean Dublin was in, um, was it uh, uh, somewhere? And this young girl called my I think, well, this mm. is 2019. 19. I'm mm. going back from 1965, you know, that time at school. Mm. In Glasgow, I think, well, wow. Mm. Mm. We're back to, to exactly square one when I was a kid growing up. Yeah. If we go back to the that, that period of the 70s, kind of, I should imagine you were sort of charged by the, the, the punk things. It was fizzling out just about the time you know, you began to get the thing together in Coventry. The, uh, it yeah. was pretty bleak then, wasn't it? It was very bleak, and uh, a, a light shone, really, and that's when the Sex Pistols and the Clash played in Coventry. Um, 
because uh, for me and my mates at that point, before that point, we could never work out how you'd be in a band or what you'd meant to do or, you know, we, we didn't grow up with music lessons. So um, then we saw The Clash and the Pistols and pretty much after that, that loads of bands started to appear and that was maybe 77. Um, but it was like on the tail end then of punk. Punk had happened. So then you discovered all these new bands and bands like, you know, Ian Jury and the Blockheads and uh, even like Elvis Costello were a part of punk, but m sort of a bit of a progression, really. You felt songs were coming through a bit more. And um, yeah, and, the, and then we sort of played together in different forms, different bands in around Coventry. And we just sort of happened to be in the same band at, at one point and the Coventry Automatics. You are the original uh, original founding member, Horace. The three, um, yeah, Lim Limbal and I, um, and, and, Jerry. And, and, and Jerry, yes. and, and then um, we had a, a singer before Terry, but only for a, 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 a few months. So, yeah. What 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 musically brought you together was it was it the obvious reggae or or, or I don't know you said soul um, and funk or what um, what would it? It was soul soul and reggae for me because obviously me born in Jamaica. You know, and carry all the the the, um, the the scar, the reggae with me, and obviously, you know, we all soul band was like, you know, the James Brown and, and all the Otis Redding was that's that, you know, just Curtis Mayfield is one of my biggest musical influence. Curtis Mayfield, you know, when it comes to, so it, it really, as Horace said, it was really soul music and funk music and and reggae. So soul reggae, that's the sort of band that I played in when when we um before I met. So, as a gentleman, when um, it was when we first started to play reggae, I really struggled with, with how it worked. So, so Limval and um, Desmond Brown, who was the keyboard player in, in, in the selector, they used to come around my flat and give me reggae lessons. <laughs> like they they they'd put these these things on, was, and um, <laughs> and I'd sort of like oh, it doesn't make sense. But and, and Limval would go, no, 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 it goes, goes like this, it goes like this. So it's like okay, so mm -hmm. so I eventually got got got, got into it. Yeah. It was so swimming because I remember. Um, <laughs> H, the drummer from the selector, teaching um, Jerry how to play reggae, and it was so funny, you know, because Jerry, you know, you, you see that, and he's he, he, and he's dribbling, and he's going like that, and uh, pump it, man, pump it, and you pump it, <laughs> what pump what, <laughs> just pump it like that, and he's dribbling like that, and he, the one thing with him, he never gave up, he decided he was gonna get it right, and I must say he got it right, he I'll, learned, you know. Mm. I've never quite really decided what. Two tone was. Some people describe it as a, a genre, or it could be a lifestyle. It could be a political leaning. How did you see what you were doing at the time? A, a band with a message, a soul band with a message, would it have been? Is that nearest to it? Do you think? I it was a record label mm. first off, mm -hmm. because it, it was something that had the, um, the had black influences and white influences mm -hmm. musically and um, sort of stylistically as well. But it, it's become to be. It's become to be an, an, an adjective now, isn't it? It's, mm. it's now a, an all-encompassing term that means something that's that's racially integrated, yeah. which, is, which is no bad thing, really. But yeah. I, I always thought, if we, the, the more we talk about it, it, the energy came over more than anything, I think, especially if you did a live performance. But it would, that, would probably that was the punk. Yeah, 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 yes, yeah you kind of feel yeah, yeah, charged by it, weren't I always you? thought that it was like the, 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 the sexiness of reggae and ska, but played with the energy of of, 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 of the Clash and the kind of powerful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you got to play with the Clash in about seventy eight, which was a probably was that that must have been a big moment for you. The Huge, tour. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, we we were connected at some point to Bernie Rhodes, the Clash manager. I'm not sure how we got the Clash tour. Um, I think I, I think it was, I think it was Jerry and me we we we, we hitched we hitched down to London. Yeah, I saw the first time me hitching with Jerry. <laughs> My God, how am I going to get? We we actually had a lift from the um the head of the the is the work union in his jag, you know, give us a yeah. lift down, you know, and um and, and that's always because Jerry was always there hustling and busting, tra you know, pleading and begging, and and I think that's how we actually met up with um with um at um the Clash Connection at um in Camden. Yeah, yeah. And what were those shows? Like, do you recall the the energy of? Uh, I often think when you talk to people about uh, you know a long career, although it's spor sporadic, that the, the early part is always very clear. It's the middle I, bit. I always uh, describe the Clash tour as we started it as civilians, but right. ended it 
as a, as a group, it was kind of, for me, it was like that, this rock and roll boot yes. camp, if you like. Mm. You know, it was, it's a great build. Dues though, were definitely paid, you know, yeah. on that tour. But, but you, I don't, you know, at the time, you, you see the specials and the clash on the same bill. It, it was fantastic. An extraordinary and, moment. And Suicide were on the same bill mm. too. And at some point, Sham 69 or Jimmy Percy, he turned up, I remember him turning up. Now, now that's weird. Yeah, but, uh, <laughs> but it was, um, it was really odd because it was like on the tail end of Punk, the Clash had become the Clash. And we were playing cities that maybe were a little bit behind what was going on in London. Mm. And so uh, Punk's in wherever it was, Bristol, or used to spit a lot. And we weren't a punk band, but we got spat on. I just, I just remember being spat on terribly. <laughs> Like every single night, Susie Sue got hepatitis through that. Like covered, <laughs> and it was really horrible. Yeah. But it was it was great. It's the first time you know you could hear your voice, and there were monitors, monitors. and there were lights. You could hear yourself, and, and you were on the stage. Yes, yeah. you were on the stage, and, and we, before that, we'd just done pubs and you know really small venues. So it, it was great. Coventry at that time, then I've not really talked about what was happening there. Was it just the uh, universities? The, there was a club scene. There was just something you obviously met, and you were all gravitated towards a place. What, what was? What do you think it was about well, that? Well, Coventry is an industrial city, you know. Yeah. You know, my, you know, my father moved, moved from Gloucester to Coventry because of work. Mm. Engineer, because there's car factories, there's Triumph motorbikes. So it's all about, you know. So it, it, re it really, I mean, it, it becomes a. Uh, a university city now, but the history of Coventry was a was, you know was um, a working class. Um, you got mine there. You, you, you know it's 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 all about it's and it, through all that obviously there's always bands and there there's um working men clubs to play at you know mm. so therefore you know we, we have lots of place to 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 learn to 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 to, like uh, to perform you know yeah, yeah. to your apprenticeship mm. and taking the shows out then beyond Coventry I suppose. Sounds a bit weird now, but uh, you know, going up to Manchester, riding through it was uh, it was an exciting thing, wasn't it? Because it had to be. Because you're was, at, That yeah. was the great thing about living in Coventry, because you could go, you could do a gig in. You're in, almost in, in the centre of the. Yeah, country. you could go. Yeah. In, you could go do a gig in London and go come back that night. You could do a gig into the Manchester or, or Liverpool or, mm. or Bristol or, or, or whatever. You know, so that was that's why there are lots of dis distribution hubs in the, in the Midlands around, around Coventry. And talking about it, it now, do you remember getting a sense of improving as you went along and more confident with the shows, getting it flowing? knowing where to plan how to plan the set out and all, these are all it's all a learning curve isn't it I, I always think the audience took us there really because the audience grew and grew and I don't know they were felt like they're a real part of it um, we were all learning together and sort of what you do at gigs and um, and there was a gig at Greyhound in Fulham I think where the window went through but places <laughs> were, were getting like sold out and um yeah it was it was a it was a learning curve really did i don't think we actually became the specials until we got our hair cut and bought suits right i mean yeah. the, that was proper the clash tour we were kind of mi mix and match kind of stuff yeah. visually yeah. but then um after we'd recorded gangsters it was like okay um you know you could back then you could still buy a second hand tonic suit up gosford street for mm. you know for you know under a fiver you know whatever. The, the suit that i wear on that first on the cover of the first album cost me seven pound fifty still have it yeah <laughs> <laughs> tell but, us about gangsters but, then because it that's i suppose i don't know pressure's the right word i suppose it's picking the right song to kick kick start your career in a way in a in a lot of in a sense isn't it gangsters was there a, was a total agreement that's the way to go at the moment because you know I think we're learning that we can't really categorise the band. I think I think I think Gangs is a story that you know, because in Bernie Rhodes, um, after we finished the Clash tour, the Emperor tour, Bernie and, um, sent us to um, to France, to Paris, and we come back with Gangster. So mm. that, that that's a story of you know, the, there's no way of actually sort of um, thinking well, which which would be the, the first thing. It was a natural because it's what we went through while while we was in in Paris. Mm. So we come back with the song. Yeah. Mm. And I suppose then you got on the telly, Top of the Pops, of course. Yeah. It must be a very important thing. Um, well, that was where it started to get surreal mm. because up until that point, you only had yourself to look at. But I think we were playing Hull that night and we watched Top of the Pops at somebody's house. But it was for me, it was really, really odd because 
I wanted to be in a band because I didn't want to do anything but be in a band. There was no goal or ambition or anything, really. It was like, this is what I want to do. And, and all of a sudden, you're on TV. And that, that changes everything, I think. It really does. It did then. Yeah. Because, yeah. you know, you could be anonymous on the Wednesday when you yeah. filmed it and yeah. Thursday it goes out at 7, 7.30. And on the Friday morning, it could be a very different thing. It sounds like... It was. It's it, a, was. it sounds like, you know, something like Last of the Summer Wine here. But that's what happened. It was a collective sharing, Top of the Pops. Yeah. It was a big show and that, that mattered at the time. And it was... You've all grew up watching it, and then, yeah. then all of a sudden you but then you're catching on yourself it. a glimpse of the, yeah, you're on, you're on it, you're like seeing yourself in the mirror. And then people it? know that you're on it, and they know you now, and it's like you don't know them, and that that's where it, where it, like, for me it got a bit weird, really. Mm. But how do you adjust then, as uh, it became mm, popular? Not very well. Right? <laughs> <laughs> no. But I kind of think it's the Badly. ultimate. I would. I would be so proud of being, of never having been on the set of Top of the Pops or anything. It's something I think of a, people of a certain age wa always wanted to aspire mm. to, I suppose, mm. be on it. Mm. I mean, I think it was, the strange part for me was like um, walking to a, a bar and then suddenly all eyes are on, and I, thought, I feel really uncomfortable. I thought, well, uh, what have I done? Have I done something wrong, you know? <laughs> and then couldn't cope with it and then walk back out. Yeah. After a while, I just couldn't, couldn't cope with it. I had to grow to get used to, you know, people... Um, seen me and and mm. I, I know where I'm through top of the pops. I think you know? some mm. people in the band took to it like a duck to war. Like Neville was always famous. Yes, yeah, well, you yeah. know what I mean. Right, so, yes, so yeah. It it, it, it it suited him, you know. Without, I don't think without with, with, without too much problem. But I, I think, um, but for other 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 members, it was a little bit painful. But you get to the the, the debut album and you're working with Elvis Costello, which is pretty amazing. I have to say, I don't know if it felt like that, but for me going, Elvis Costello was producing that album. It's just like, it's, it's just some of the greatest things. It was great, and I, I'm, again, I don't know how that happened, but I remember him coming to gigs, I remember him coming to see us in Bournemouth, and he was sort of a musician who'd made records, and he just sort of happened then to produce it. He was in the studio with us, that's my real memory of it. It wasn't like we need a producer, how many points, it wasn't that. It was like... It did feel quite organic. He was a real fan of the band. Um, and, uh, yeah, then he worked with us. Was he a guide then at the time? Because I should, you're, you're, you're new to well, putting together 10, 11 tracks, maybe 12 for an album. I, where do, you need some guidance, don't you? Did you go in with songs, we'd, cover we'd, versions? We'd done some recording prior to that, but it wasn't, very, wasn't particularly brilliant. So it was good to have someone on the other side of the glass who was on your side and who had an idea what what we wanted to do? Did you need focus at that point? Then would you would you you probably would need some sort of focus? Well, you? no, we just we, we 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 knew what we sounded like, yeah. and we, it was just a question of playing it, of, of recording it really. Yeah. So we just basically played our what we played when we did gigs in a room with a tape recorder, really. I mean, and could you convince Elvis Costello that the things that you wanted? Because it's hard to sort of uh, explain yourself, I suppose, when. I thought it was, it was quite easy because all the songs were already there. Right. Okay. So it's just like him uh, 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 sitting there and just yes, no, guide us through, and we because oh. we just played exactly all we played and, and um, try and play live as much as you yes, can yeah, to keep the energy live, going. Yeah. Mm. yeah. The mm. um, th that album was successful. You were becoming you you became very successful very quick, and you know when you get to Special AK, for instance, that was a. Mm. Huge breakthrough, another TV moment, and, and all the rest of it. Did what? What was the, the biggest change in around about that period when I suppose it's coming at you? Somebody described it. It was to be recently. I think it might have been uh, Paul Simon, and it was like um, being in a car going downhill without brakes on, or something like that, or uh, mm. uh, you know, looking back through a prism. Do you recall? I suppose it, it's like being on a, a, a pretty fast fairground ride or something, isn't it? When you're going through the eye of the storm stuff. Isn't it? Well, I, I actually remember very little. I remember key things mm. like Top of the Pops mm. or um, like we did a gig on a pier in New York. I remember key things, but day to day I don't remember. It, it just sort of, yeah, we j it just fell into it. And, th uh, you know, th th that was a point where there's no internet, no mo mobile phones. And it's like, I don't know how we communicated even. Um, like a pigeon or something. It was like <laughs> just to get us together. But we all used to know where everybody else was, and all of a sudden there'd be a tour um, or or whatever it was, and we'd just get together. But I've got no real memory apart from specific highlights, which were like you know from a kid you'd think I want to see New York and 
Japan and stuff. So they're the only memories I've got. Um, and me memory kicked in really when we were recording Ghost Town. That's the part I remember yeah. mm. most, really. The it was a movement then, was it, along with the specials, uh, Selector, Rhoda Dakar, Madness and other other acts. Did it feel like that or was it, I, I tend to think it was probably fragmented quite quickly, all of that. that you were In 1979, to... you know, yeah. well, two -tone, the, the, the two-tone tour was yeah. um, specials, Madness and the Selector. Right. Um, we, we then went on to sign the beat. Um, then, um, then the, the, the following year, the body snatchers arrived. That's right. right. Yeah. 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 So yeah, there were there were a, um, and like two tone became a musical genre rather than just the name of a record label. But you must have felt a little different to the rest of them. I suppose everybody in, in that uh, in that period probably felt that they offered something a little bit different. But specials were way ahead of everybody on the label, weren't they? And probably yeah. way ahead of most bands around at the time. That's the yeah. that's not you showing off. That's Fact, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, moving on then to the soap opera that is Ghost Town. Terry, I seem to you remember telling me a long, long time ago that it took a, a, an age to, to make and it, you were falling apart as it was recorded. It was very difficult. Um, what was the, was it just the process you weren't getting on by this stage? Uh, well, I don't think we were getting on that, mm. that great and I think we'd splintered a bit into our own little camps and um, I, I, I do remember like being on a tour bus and all of a sudden there were like little groups on tour bus and people were starting to bring their mates on the tour bus. So they had someone to talk to then rather than the band. And um, it felt really splintered. And it was after more specials, which I thought was a really brilliant record. I, I actually, it's my favorite out of the two, the mm. first two. But um, it was then a question of what direction do we go in and where do we go from there really? and. I don't think we could all agree, even though a lot of it was unsaid, we, we couldn't all agree on the direction we wanted to go in. And if you look at how we looked on stage at that point after more specials, it was a million miles away from the first album. I mean, that was a massive change very mm. quickly. And yeah, I, I, I didn't feel like we were all pulling the same way, really. Mm. So it, dystopian Britain, bleak, inspiring, and the sound of a band falling apart, is that what it is? More <laughs> yeah, I suppose so. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> succinctly put there. Mm -hmm. But you, out of the out of the adversity becomes an extraordinary record, which is probably one of the greatest pop singles. Certainly, would be in the one of the greatest fifty great singles of all time. Mm -hmm. uh, well, it's very hard to sort of describe a single as uh, as I know. Penny Lane and Strawberry Fields is a single. Yeah. <laughs> A single in the sleeve, and it, it becomes something more than just a record spinning around on the needle. You know, it's, it becomes part of a, the culture and the well, life. I think all great singles tell you a, a lot about how you live at that point. And, you know, you go back to the 60s and the 50s even, mm -hmm. and a, a great single will tell you what the environment's like, what society's like. I think Ghost Town definitely did that because that Kept was exactly crime. how it felt. And... Um, it was like watching Clockwork Orange, that record for me. It's a, yeah. It's a very... It's like being in Clockwork Orange. <laughs> 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 but, I mean, uh, concrete <laughs> held, you know, it, it, and it uh, that still sort of resonates with me. After it, this is where it gets a little convoluted, and we can go on this, that, and the other, and um, it ends up with you somewhere along the line getting on and all getting back together as a core, most mm. of you. Who, yeah. How did that happen? Who started? Linville. Well, um, the one you, the, you, were the, live, you were the instigator. Yeah, because I, I live in America, so I, I usually um, come back here, you know, and I met up with Jerry all the time when working with him on a little project that he does. And, um, and then um, Simon Jordan, sort of, you know, you, you see on um, Crystal Palace, sort of um, got involved and... Um, Loved the specials and and but he was too young to see the specials, you know, in in, in special ED. So an idea come up for that he would love to see the band get back together. And um, but you think you obviously thought it was a good idea. Yes, he did, and I think he he I, I, I agree with him it was a good idea as well. So that's where the old things triggered from. Was this two thousand and eight ish? What was it? Um, 
It was a long time before then. Yeah. Oh, right, yeah. 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 It, it, was, it was years before then, because it, it took like five years to get to get the old thing back together. You know, I was... What was it, Kate? Was it a case of try, whether you could spend some time in a confined space? It's just talking to each other, communicating and get back. You know, I met, uh, I met up back with Terry Dunn by in, in the West End and we, we chat and we, we say, well, you know, we'll talk about the old days and, we, you know, we got on. Then I um, talked to... Um, to, to Jerry and, and talk to Brad. Every, I just talked to everyone. Mm. As sorry, at times called me Sir Henry Kissinger, you know? <laughs> so, the, so the Henry I, Kissinger of two times. Yeah. Mm. So I did all the, you know, moving around and talking to each other until we get, get I got six sort of, um, seven um, times. At uh, times I, I thought we had Jerry there, but eventually it just mm. didn't turn out that yeah, way. Yeah. And um, There's much been said about mm. uh, Jerry Dam as you started the group with Jerry, didn't you? Uh, mm, Norris, mm, and mm. I would imagine you're the man to comment on the relationship with uh, Jerry, who was integral to, to the band, of course. And then as things progress, it didn't quite work out. It ends that didn't really want you to progress as the band. Is that is that correct? Well, he wanted to progress. And I think the rest of us were, were, were indecisive about sort of whether that was, if it's like, it, it ain't broke, don't, don't fix it, you know. I mean, but, Roddy said something um, interesting. He said that the second specials album was like going from with the Beatles to Sergeant Pepper without doing Rubber Soul, mm. which I thought was, was quite an interesting thing. Because that, 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 so that's what happened really. We 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 had this formula that worked, which was great, but then we did something totally different. And there were those who went with it, and there were those who, and th those who didn't. And um, I think that's that. But that was, I think that's already been talked about with mm. sort of Ghost Town. It was yeah, just, yeah. it just became very difficult for seven people who had at one stage all been facing the same way, um, you know, now splintered and mm. were now facing different directions and had different agendas. I would have thought, Terry, you would have took a bit of convincing. I just, I think I know that. I did, yeah. And uh, because I, I was approached all the way through the 80s, 90s to reform the group because I was a singer and mm. I never really wanted to do that. I wanted to just try different things out. And, um, but I think it just happened at a point where we started to see each other. Uh, like I hadn't seen anybody for years and years. And um, I just felt this sort of weird bond with everyone all of a sudden, which I'd never felt um, because, you know, the last I saw of everybody was when we were going nuts and it was like it was hard to be in the same room as anyone else and but then it felt all right and it felt like we'd all grown up a bit and we'd all had kids and families and divorce whatever we'd experienced stuff so it felt a lot easier and I uh, we met up in King's Cross I don't even know what year it was some year before we started playing again and it was just really brilliant to see everyone in the same room and, and if we didn't perform that was fine but to see everybody in the same room and like just look around and see where everybody, how everybody's turned out, it was really lovely. And I, I think I felt a deep love for everybody. I think people were suspicious of my deep love. <laughs> but, um, I think they were a bit freaked out at one point, but I, I just felt like, you know, things are all right, mm. you know. What was the reticence then? Was it was it protecting the legacy? Was it trying to move the band along, which you, you have now in, in as we sit here? But at the time, what what were you looking to achieve? Just to get in a room together, go and play a show, and see what? I suppose it was just testing the water all the time. I had bit. changed careers. I was a school teacher. Right. Um, you know, I'm settled I, at that. I, I was salar salaried. You know, I, yeah. I'd written a book about you know my life in the specials. You know, because there was no chance we'd ever get back together again. You know. Um, and all this sort of stuff. So, um, and I had a really good job. So, oh, am I going to give this up mm. for what? You know, for, and then remembering what it was like last time we were, were all, you know, in a group mm. together. This probably wasn't a good idea. But you know, um, there was something amazing about being in the specials, about you know, about playing those songs to to, to, to people and something, what those songs something meant. Igni so, ignite something. So ignite something. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Mm. So that was always there. That's interesting. You know. Yeah. Um, and it looked like you know, we, we thought, well, perhaps we could do it just for the 30th anniversary. So perhaps, perhaps I could just sort of like, you know, um, duck out of teaching for a year and then go back to it, right. you know, or, or whatever. So I, you I, could still go I back to it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, well, n n not now, because I'm, uh, I, I, I retired. You know, oh, right. Yeah. Oh, good. Retired to go yeah. be, uh, be in a band. I think, I, I, I think it was like the music, you know, without the music, 
we probably wouldn't. It, it, it was a strength of the music. Yeah. That got I, us back together. Yeah, it, it's interesting because you can... Sort of playing those songs was yeah. like, so give us such a, wow. It, it was such a wonderful feeling to play those songs. But conversely, so conversely, you can undo a lot of good work, can't you? I think if, uh, well, I think you can, but I don't think we could. I think, um, I, I still think we're a great band, as we were in 79. And, I, I, you know, I, I, I know that because we still play and there's still a massive demand for us to play. And if we weren't great, there wouldn't be a demand. Mm. You know, mm. it's like, I've just looked today, we've sold like 70,000 tickets for a UK tour. So that's the demand. Mm. We're not sort of begging people for a gig. Do you know what I mean? It's mm. like, we still feel like an important group. And I think in the last two or three years, it seems to be crossing to a younger generation too. And that is really lovely to see kids at the front and who, who are into our, our music and who have, you know, been handed down our first album and st started to understand what we're saying, you know, and mm. it's really great. But you'd have thought, uh, we're sat here in 2019, the number one album, you're getting on and you're selling out with, on a huge tour, celebrating your 40th anniversary, I suppose. Life's a bit weird. <laughs> very, very strange. Life's <laughs> <very weird. laughs> but uh, how do you view it then at the moment, looking, looking at you know, dates selling out and people are liking your new music? Because it's obviously important and to be relevant as well after such a long time is it's pretty important as well. You still have something to offer. That's essentially why you're probably sat here talking about it, isn't it? The fact that you've been able to put a record together that well, it's, reflects. It's just brilliant. It's like we've been rehearsing for two weeks and to rehearse new material that has never been heard live is just really great. And it's like, it makes it really exciting again for us, I think. And working with new people and, you know, we've always had this policy where if you were in the specials in 79, you can be now if you want. It's up to you. Yeah. It's totally up to you. Mm -hmm. But people choose not to be. Three people choose not to be. Mm -hmm. And uh, they do their own thing. But we know the value of the band, really. And I don't think any of us think that we're bigger than that name. Mm -hmm. It's like, that is the name. And we're, we're a part of it. Really. And working new songs into the set, they'll be very different by the end of the tour. Things, they grow and, and it's like, you know, yeah. having a child and off they run, really, yeah. isn't it? Isn't it? Yeah. It's fascinating, yeah, We have isn't it? moved on and I think that's, that's great. You know, I think it was a long time coming. But, but to actually sort of find a, a new, not, not, not a new identity, that's, that's the wrong thing, but like a, a, a mutation, if you like, and it's, and it's, it's now going somewhere else. And do you, can you think beyond this moment? Uh, uh, no. No, <laughs> That's the secret we've point again. Never, no, we've never, yeah, okay. had a, we've never had a long-term plan. It's always been, oh, what can we do this next year? Okay, we've never seen, we, we've never sort of gone further than that, really. And you travel the world to, to be in this band, so it mean it obviously means a lot to you being away mm. from the family and and on a, a tour that's going to last a few months. Do you you want it to continue, don't you? And enjoying it? it's part of your life. You want well, to after I took the, the um, sort of seven, because I've, I've done, I would say probably one of the most important job that anyone could ever do in their life, especially from the male side, from you know from the man side, the stay at home dad. Mm. I stayed home dad to my son in, in America I for seven years, and that's all I wanted to do, just to be with him. And then obviously when he started going after kindergarten, started going after school, I started going, well, well I'm just here all, all on my own now. You, you, my, my little partner's my little mate has gone after school now. And it was it, actually it was Dave Wakelin from the, from the beat who got me back into playing. He said, because he, he lives in LA, and Dave sort of rang him and says, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm still enjoying being the stay at home dad. So well, just get a guitar back and come out and skank. Then I says, skank, what is that? <laughs> so he got me out, 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 you know, out playing again um, and got back in the music and I just think, well... Yeah. It's interesting because mm. you're all sitting here you're all fathers. Mm. Um, mm. Does it matter if the kids like it? Do you want, the, do you want your kids to like it? No. Five minutes. Okay. I think if my kids like it, I'd stop. Really. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> it is because it's like, it's, it's, it's like my son, he's, um, he loves jazz. And he's really into, you know, he, he, he plays in the, in the orchestra as well. And so it's completely the opposite from, from where I am musically. So, he, you know. Well, we've got um, five minutes. Let, mm. Let's try and wrap up things. I could talk forever. It, the special ascendancy was swift. It was a couple of years, seven hit singles, two number ones, two hit albums, 
and sell out tours. It still is now. How, how do you reflect on your career at this point, Terry? Uh, now it's like the, the, we we're just talking about the idea of looking ahead and planning. And it doesn't figure anymore, but it's um, I'm still really, really grateful that I wake up in the morning and I think, well, I'm in a group. And I've now just turned mm. 60. I'm in 60. I'm in a group. Pretty good. We've just had a number one record. We've got a tour ahead of us. It's fantastic. And mm. then I just look at the day and think, um, I've got to go to Sainsbury's at some point. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a good day. Yeah. It's a really good day. And as long as that continues, I'm happy. What about you, Horace? How does it feel? Is it like looking being on the top of a mountain, looking back back down onto... No, it's, it's, it's pretty good. I mean, I... I don't necessarily have to go to Sainsbury's, but I, I do have to go over the road to buy groceries. <laughs> yeah, but, it's, uh, me, but... but yeah, I, I wake up in the morning and I go, gosh, I'm the bass player in the specials. Yeah. You know, there aren't many people in the world who can say that. Uh, long may you continue. Thank you for, Cheers. for sharing your life together. Mm. The best music all day. Virgin Radio.